And capitalist America, slavery was so important that there were, we fought a civil war over it. And even that didn't end the practices of slavery, but it did evolve into a very special kind of bigotry, you know? One that involved like yeah. pretending you're a ghost all the time while calling yourself a dragon for some fucking reason. <laughs> <laughs> a grand dragon. A grand dragon, which what does it have to do with ghosts? Nobody knows. That's the secret. <laughs> right? You hoist the flag of the loser all the time. And I think this mm -hmm. is the biggest cardinal sin, uh, sin of uh, capitalism is an excessive amount of truck nuts. Too many truck nuts. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, there's too many out there. One is too many. One is, yeah. yeah. Well, I feel like a two would be too many, but that's fine. Uh, one would be hilarious if it's just one. A single truck. Nut. A single <laughs> testicle on a truck would be hilarious to me, but we're deviating. We're. we're, we're... No! Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Fork Full of Noodles. I'm your host, Krish Mohan. Hey, you might notice some people laughing in the background of these episodes, and that is because this was filmed in front of a live virtual audience via Zoom. Uh, I do these shows three times a month, record them in front of a live virtual audience, uh, and you can be a part of this live virtual audience by getting tickets to one of these shows uh, where you can go get your tickets at krishmohanhaha.com. They're only $5 for one show, or you can get a multi-show pass and save uh, a few extra bucks. Uh, but if you become a sustaining member of this show, either on Patreon uh, or directly on my website or via PayPal or through Bandcamp, various different ways where you can become a sustaining member, you get free tickets to come to see the Citizen Revolution live virtual stand-up comedy shows, which eventually become episodes of Fork Full of Noodles, which is awesome. Uh, and not only that, uh, but these shows are filmed in the River's Edge studio, which is part of the River's Edge radio network. And I couldn't be thankful for uh, more thankful for being a part uh, of, of the studio. Uh, the River's Edge is your place to get local Pittsburgh music from the Pittsburgh area 24-7. Just go to the TuneIn app, download that app, and look for the River's Edge radio network. It's a 24-hour stream of independent music. The radio station is independently owned uh, and is located in Pittsburgh in the heart of Millvale. So you'll be supporting an independent local radio station. So check them out. Uh, and once again, if you want to get tickets to the shows, if you want to become a patron, if you want to make a donation, uh, if you want to check out past episodes of the show, go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com. Thank you very much. And now onwards to the show. Joe Biden is a socialist. That, that's pretty much what... <laughs> I'm not having a stroke. I'm just I'm just letting you guys know what what the con conservative media has been screaming about Joe Biden since June, it seems. Look, Joe Biden is as much a socialist as I am a G.I. Joe. Right? <laughs> Actually, come to think of it, Joe Biden might be the G.I. Joe. Like he might be the Joe in G.I. Joe, considering he brags. <laughs> about how much pride he has in all of the wars that he's voted for, right? The war on terror, the war on drugs, the war on black people, the war against <laughs> his own brain. Mm. Yo, Joe. <laughs> Yo, Joe, I think, I think you might have some severe problems with your cognitive abilities, and you should probably go see a doctor about that. You really should probably go see a doctor about that. But the word socialism in America has pretty much lost all context thanks to the corporate media, right? All, all, and that's all of the corporate media, not just the conservative ones. And right now in our, in, in our cultural zeitgeist, within our generation, the most famous socialist is probably former presidential candidate 
and friend to G.I. Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders. And all the liberal media basically came out and said, well, Bernie can't be the Democratic nominee because everybody over at Fox News will just, they'll call him a socialist and we can't have that, so he can't be the nominee. Yet, we hear that Joe Biden, the anti-Medicare for all, <laughs> anti-universal basic income, pro-war, pro-dementia candidate, <laughs> is a socialist. Everybody's got to have a job, man. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's got to have a job, yeah. <laughs> There's one guy at Fox News that specifically is like, how do I call Joe Biden a socialist this week? <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's that guy's job. Look, Joe Biden is a capitalist, right? He's always been a capitalist, and he's always going to be a capitalist, right? Yo, Joe! <laughs> Yo, Joe, if you really want to distance yourself from the, the, the creepy S word, the oh, it's so scary S word, maybe you should go on all of the corporate media and talk about how great it is to be a capitalist, you know, while you're tickling the balls of a big pharma lobbyist. <laughs> <laughs> I think that'll do it. Socialism in the eyes of most Americans that watch one or more of the corporate mainstream media news outlets think that it's the government coming into your homes, using taxes as a label maker to say that they own all your stuff, right? They, they believe that under socialism, there's, you get, there's like one doctor, right? One car mechanic, one grocer, and, and we all have to share them with our one collective family in our one two collective two bedroom homes with our one dog and one cat that we're allowed to pet once a day and that's it. <laughs> so we're allowed. Yeah, I, I don't think that that is a real government system like anywhere, but uh, I can tell you one thing for sure that, that that's not fucking socialism. <laughs> <laughs> and the real truth of it all is that it's very, very difficult to define what socialism actually is. I wish I could sit here and tell you that this is the definition of socialism. But if I did such a thing, you should turn the program off and go elsewhere. Because anybody who tells you that this is socialism is either ignorant or misleading you. Socialism has been around for 150 years. It has spread all over the world. And the end result, inevitably is that different people mean different things by that term. Now, it's taken various different forms, and socialism itself can actually be a very nuanced idea, right? Socialism can be an economic principle, a form of government, or even a way of life. It's diverse, not just in its definition, but also in its acceptance of people from all walks of life. That's something I don't think capitalism can really say, right? This is a system that kept, wanted to keep black people enslaved and then tried to revoke bathroom access for trans people. Mm -hmm. Like it also believes that voting is for rich white landowners still. Yeah, guys, it's 2020. No one here owns the land, man. <laughs> we rent it. Amen. That's what we do. <laughs> and all the land has already been brought up, bought up by evil corporations that are just taking their revenge on Mother Earth, who friend zoned them about a century ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. How dare she? <laughs> How dare she not date Exxon? How dare she? <laughs> but each country practices socialism slightly differently. Look, capitalism is what we call the economy in the United States. It's also what the leaders of Saudi Arabia call their economic system. And it's also what the people in Ireland call theirs, and it's also what the people in Nigeria call theirs. Therefore, it obviously means different things to different people. Look, it's, it's kind of like playing the guitar, right? Like you can play jazz or rock and roll, or if you're like a true badass, you play like a rap, 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 rock, metal core combo, which is a very difficult genre to say, apparently. 
but all in all, you're still playing the guitar, right? But now, obviously, capitalism isn't as cool as playing the guitar, no matter how dope and on fleek capital, capitalists say they are. They lie to you about that. Now, capitalism is an economic system that's all about controlling politics and the way of life for, for a lot of people, right? Historically, it has led to more slavery, decreasing quality of life for a lot more people, exploitation, and let's be honest, it's also led to the largest collection of infomercials involving cutting things that don't need to be cut. <laughs> <laughs> I saw this boat in half. <laughs> Why? Why did you? That's not what a boat is for. <laughs> By the way, that is the greatest infomercial of all time. I, I, if you haven't seen the flex tape infomercial, it is the craziest infomercial ever. <laughs> <laughs> but according to Marxist economist and professor emeritus, Dr. Richard Wolff, there are three basic types of socialism, right? The first form is where the, the myths surrounding socialism really come from. The government should, here we go, directly take over the enterprises. There shouldn't be private enterprises because those will always be run for the profit of the private owner. If you want the economy to serve everybody, then the agent of everybody, the government that we all elect, at least in theory, should take over and run the businesses so they behave in the way that's good for everybody and there isn't this perpetual war between a regulating government and private enterprise. And the same argument says we shouldn't allow the market to decide who gets what because a market always delivers whatever is scarce to the people with the most money. It's a institution for works. those who are rich and who stay that way by using the market. So these socialists go further. The government should take over enterprises, literally own and operate the factories, stores, and offices. And instead of the market deciding who gets what, it should be planned in terms of what we want for the society as a whole. These kinds of socialists, after the 1920s, took the name communists to signal that they went further than the other socialists in order to take over through the government the apparatus of the economy. So some people mean by socialism government regulating a private capitalism to make it more humane, to make it less unequal, and other people say no, 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 socialism means for them that the government takes over the enterprise and plans the distribution of output rather than leaving it to the market. And this second group of socialists often, not always, but often takes the name communist to show how they're different from the first group. And in those kinds of examples, the Soviet Union, the People's Republic of China, and for parts of their history, Cuba, Vietnam, and so on are examples. So this is basically what the right wing and the neoliberal political personalities think socialism is, right? They think it's communism and more specifically authoritarian communism. Right. Right yeah. the, the idea behind communism hinges on a few making the decision for the masses, which is very similar to a democracy <laughs> run by capitalism, right? The wealthiest in the society are the ones that really write and control legislation. And the but countries the poor we're going to run the show. Yeah, the, yeah, exactly. And the countries that we associate with communism are primarily China and Russia. And because we're supposed to be polar opposites, right? Capitalist countries have a very low opinion of countries like China, despite getting all of our stuff made there. <laughs> yeah, I, I, <laughs> but the reality is that China's economy has grown significantly and they are now an economic superpower because of some of their communist principles. Over the last 25 years, counting from right now, the Chinese economy went from one of the poorest backward to the second one after the United States fast catching up. 
extraordinary. Average annual rate of growth of output in China over the last 25 years, roughly 10 percent. Average rate of growth over the last 25 years in the United States, 3 percent. That's not even close. They are catching up because they're doing it faster and better than anyone has done it before. Now, partly they're learning the lessons of countries that went before them, but everybody's trying to do that. China has been number one in world economic growth for the last 20 years out of all the countries on the planet. I mean, whatever you say about them has to be said taking into account these realities. Let me be as stark as I can imagine. Over the last 20 years, the average real wage in America, the amount of money you get for a job uh, connected to the prices you have to pay, so it's a measure of how much you can really afford with your average wage, has been stagnant in the United States. We have about the same real wage now that we did 20 years ago. In China, over the same time, the average real wage has quadrupled. I mean, you can play around it, you can pretend it isn't there, but then you're a little bit like the child who's two years old, scared by a dog, puts the fingers in front of their eyes and imagines the dog goes away until they're a little bit more mature and realize you can do that, but the dog is still there. The issue that we, the problem is with this is like, we really haven't seen a truly communist nation. Right, one where the government and the private enterprises are run by social responsibility to the people and everybody is working towards the common goal of prosperity and happiness for all. Right? And that's not just me saying that. That is also a company called Now This, which is a subsidiary of a neoliberal paper, Huffington Post. They are also saying this. This might come as a surprise, but in the history of the modern world, there has never been a communist country. While a number of countries have <laughs> described themselves as communist, for example, yep. China and North Korea, by definition, Amazing. there has never been a true communist country. I mean, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I told you. <laughs> it was a, Mind that up. blown. I know. The issue with communism, though, is that we forget about fear and insecurities and human greed and the manufactured need for power. Right? So usually these form of governments turn into communist dictatorships rather than utopias. That's kind of what happens when you deify your leaders. But again, this is no different than capitalist dictatorships, right? America has its fair share of authoritarian forces in effect that are run by capitalists. The use of surveillance technologies, rampant militarism, not just in our military, but also cops, mm -hmm. a, an expanding income divide and consistent media propaganda is just a few of the dictatorial tactics that are used right here in the United States. Now this, the uh, news program that we, just, that we just saw, has taken socialist countries like Venezuela and deemed it a communist dictatorship in its mm. efforts to basically use all forms of media to slander the shit out of socialism. Corruption is rampant in countries like the former USSR, Venezuela, Vietnam, and North Korea, largely due to people in power abusing that power instead of using it to help the society they control and refusing to give up that power to the people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let me ask you this. What exactly is dictatorial about Nicolas Maduro canceling rents for six months during a pandemic and providing <laughs> food for families? Right? And Venezuela is known to have one of the most fair and democratic elections in the world. Right? Maduro was legally elected out of five different parties, and the only ones that don't agree with this legal election of Nicolas Maduro are the corrupt American capitalist politicians. Those are the only ones. And the question I think we should be asking in America is what did the politicians here do? You know, the ones that slandered Maduro and socialism as a form of dictatorship, what did they do to help the American people? I'd say having two right-wing parties arguing over exactly how much pittance the plebs should be getting is a dictatorship, right? But it is more of a collective dictatorship, though, you know, like mm -hmm. a lot of them, they got together in a room, they had like a blood orgy, you know, it's like a fun, <laughs> it's 
like an exciting dictatorship. <laughs> but, but this is why America likes to associate socialism with dictatorships, because the only way America has figured out how to use socialism is with dictatorships. Mm -hmm. Now, the second form of socialism is socialism as a government, right? This is usually called a social democracy. This form of government uses capitalism as an economic force, but it tries to, you know, make it nice with socialist regulations. The government is to come in and regulate, control a private capitalist economy. That's right, an economy governed by private enterprises owned by private citizens who trade with one another in an institution called the market, where they buy and sell their labor, their work, their products, their services. That's right, it's a capitalist economy, private enterprise, markets, but one in which the government is brought in. Some people mean socialism by that. And they mean particularly that the government is brought in in a, in a certain way. Number one, the government is to regulate what the private enterprises do so that they are less self-serving, profit-oriented, and are more socially concerned. That's why they minimum wage is something socialists always supported. Many of them want there to be limits on how much prices can be raised by corporations or how much profits can be earned by them. And the second reason socialists want the government to come in is to redistribute wealth, because capitalism has this tendency to concentrate wealth in very few hands and deprive the mass of people. So the socialists want the government to come in using taxes and using government spending to do a bit of redistribution, to equalize a system that turns unequal very quickly. So, look, trying to use social responsibility as a way to regulate capitalism is like trying to use a sandcastle to regulate a hurricane, right? Like, the hurricane is still in control and is going to do whatever it wants to do. The bottom line for private en enterprises is always the accumulation of wealth. And if we add social responsibility and social justice to the mix, it's just going to make those movements into a product. And it's not like we haven't seen that before, right? I mean, look at what Pepsi has done with the growing Black Lives Matter movement last year. They used Kendall Jenner to try to fucking sell you Pepsi, you know? And not just that, but Nike co-opted Colin Kaepernick's message to sell their shoes. Now, sure, conservatives burned Nikes in protest, but they still had to go out and buy new Nikes just to <laughs> set them on fire. That's right. Look, at the end of the day, even outrage was turned into a product to improve the bottom line. Now, capitalism isn't the economy of social responsibility, right? Would a socially responsible economy be looking for new ways to use slavery to benefit itself for the sake of larger profits? The answer is no. No, it fucking wouldn't. That's crazy, right? But in America, the largest capitalist nation around, we have a chasm of income divide, right? More, more people in debt of, of all kinds and stagnant wages. And we offer internships too, which... <laughs> That's just white collar slavery right there is all that is. <laughs> Let's be honest with ourselves. Now, social democrats throughout history have gone out to use the principles of socialism to regulate capitalists, but time and time again, they've given in to capitalistic viewpoints. In the early mm -hmm. 1900s, the social democrats of Europe gave in to nationalistic pressures to support the war efforts, right? It, they, they were basically slandered, saying that if you don't support the war, then you're, you're not a good German, you're not a good Fr a French, or and things of that sort. And not only did that mean that more working class men were sent to die for the causes of the rich, but the military is one of the biggest money makers for a capitalist nation. Hence why in America, 
it, we give them the socialist treatment here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the American military is the biggest socialist secret in this capitalist nation, right? If you're in the American military as a career soldier, you can get your housing covered, medical assistance taken care of, your education paid off, and when you retire, you get a pretty damn good pension. Now, the military is all about social safety nets if you stay in for the long haul. But if you're a veteran, they give you a hat and a greeting card and tell you to find some bootstraps to pick yourself up by. But, you know, thank you for your service and all that. Mm -hmm. Now, the issue with social democracies is that in an attempt to play nice with capitalism, they wind up fighting for bare minimum and compromises because capitalism is still in control. In the 70s, uh, the European Social Democrats started lining up with neoliberal economic policies. Right? These ideas don't help the working class or average citizens. They just worked with capitalists to put a price tag on social responsibility. And social democratic countries like Finland didn't really give true socialist ideas a fair fighting chance. A couple of years ago, they haphazardly attempted universal basic income for half of the unemployed population and deemed the experiment a failure because it neither increased nor decreased happiness. But a concept like UBI can't work if it's given to a small portion of the population because the idea is a universal basic income, which means that everybody has to get it in order for it to actually successfully work. The real issue with social democracy is that everything hinges on electoral politics, right? If, 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 the, if socialism can be the government, then capitalism can be regulated and the workers have their big day in the sun. Much like a capitalist democracy, elections in a social democracy are bought out by the capitalists, making it an ineffective system to implement socialist principles to, to regulate something like a gluttonous beast that is capitalism. Oh, and FYI, this is not me telling people to not vote. I think you should go out and vote. But this is me saying that, that that's not the be all end all, right? Just, just casting your vote doesn't end your duty as a citizen to any nation, regardless of what economic ideology you believe in. It means that we have to be more involved and less complacent and apathetic to drive change in for the betterment of mankind. So fucking go vote. <laughs> <laughs> but former presidential candidate uh, of uh, the Socialist Party of America once said, voting for socialism is not socialism any more than a menu is a meal. But putting a socialist in office, especially in capitalist countries, won't get us socialist principles or put forth the ide ideologies of human dignity and cooperation that socialism preaches. Voting for socialism doesn't work without the presence of a strong labor movement and an empowered proletariat. And in fact, this was the idea and momentum behind <laughs> the Bernie Sanders campaign. Yeah, America's, America's grandpa. grandpa. <laughs> Now, as we all know, Bernie ran with the Democratic Party and got cheated out of the election in 2016. But he did spark a movement that contributed to the fact that young people no longer associate the word socialism with, you know, fucking satanic hellfire engulfing this Christian nation. <laughs> we can hope. And we, yeah, no, hopefully. We might be wrong. There's like a small percentage chance. <laughs> But ideas like Medicare for all, low or free public colleges, and even universal basic income are starting to become more and more popular in a capitalist country like America. But then in 2020, he did it again. He ran with the same party that screwed him over to begin with. And a lot of these corporate candidates from Joe Biden to Elizabeth Warren to Kamala Harris were all parroting Bernie Sanders' talking points. But then they'd go back to CNN, Kamala Harris did this a whole bunch, where they'd go back to CNN to clarify what they meant, right? They go up and be like, look, I was very confused about the question of, of, of whether I am for or against Medicare for all. What a confusing question. 
you know, and, and then you have the Telemundo reporter who has a very strange but beautiful accent. So it's difficult to understand that. Or, or they would just say that they were saying it to say it, right? White lies of helping black and brown and low income communities. Now this allowed corporate Democrats, which are most Democrats, to pick up Bernie's rhetoric and use it as a way to bolster pro-capitalist, pro-corporate, anti-worker legislation. Social Democrats, and that's, and that's what Bernie Sanders is, he's a social Democrat, like Bernie Sanders, can't reform capitalistic parties or economic systems from within. Once you're in, they, they, they just fucking, they get you in, and then they consume you, you know? You know how they, like, you have to eat something to gain its power? That's what, that's what they do, they consume you. <laughs> <laughs> they stole Bernie's power. They stole his essence. And then they tried to give it to Joe Biden, but I don't think it's working. <laughs> oh, man. It is, his body is Lost just cause. drifting it like a fucking bad organ. You know, like, it is not working. But that's what they do. You, they, your words start losing that revolutionary sheen and then you get the dull code of platitudes put on you, right? <laughs> things like, yeah, like things like Medicare for all become access to choices in healthcare, which is fucking not Medicare for all. <laughs> not the same thing. Not the same thing. Now, Eugene Debs uh, of the Socialist Party of America did try to reform the Democrats from within from the mid to late 1800s. He was a uh, part of the House of Representatives in the state of Indiana. And he basically discovered that Democrats are, and they have been, and kind of always will be the party of private interests and corporations, right? Way back in the 18, uh, 1800s, he fought for, for railroad uh, employees, for railroad workers to uh, essentially get them paid when they get hurt on the job it passed through the House, and then Senate Democrats killed that bill. Later on, he goes on to form the Socialist Party of America, uh, and basically he was going up against the Democrats because he wanted a party for the working class people. And once that happened, it was the Democrats that approved the Espionage Act and the Federal Reserve Act to attack socialists. And it was a Democrat that worked with Republicans on the Taft-Hartley Act to gut unions. Now, the positive in terms of electoral politics and socialism is that socialists are winning, right? Since 2017, there has been a rise of socialist candidates that have won various local and national elections. One of the most famous ones is Shama Savant. She's a socialist uh, city council member in Seattle that has basically fought off Jeff Bezos' reach into that city. Yeah. This is how crazy it got that Jeff Bezos spent over a million dollars in December of 2019 to try to get rid of one socialist city council member. One million dollars to get rid of one socialist, and he fucking failed. He failed. <laughs> That's chump change to him. Yeah. yeah, it is chump change to him, but you know, I feel like that was the city of Seattle handing his ass. You know, it was like shipped and Absolutely. handled by the people of Seattle and delivered his loss in less than two days. Oh, I thought that joke was clever. Yeah, oh, never mind. <laughs> Denied. I, was, I know, you guys were just like, that's fine, dude. It's... Now, there's also folks like AOC, right? Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and the squad. And the difference between AOC and Shama Savant is that AOC tried the Bernie Sanders social Democrat method while Shama Savant ran as it, within the Socialist Alternative Party. She embraced the term socialist while, you know, Bernie and AOC just kind of shook its hand a little bit. It was a firm handshake though. It's a firm handshake. And by the way, this isn't me saying that I hate Bernie or AOC, but rather that they can do a little bit better and fight a little bit harder while embracing the title of socialist. The, the people will get behind you if you continue to keep fighting for them. Here's the thing, when you hinge revolutionary change and social responsibility on electoral politics, I think it's doomed to fail. 
right? Politicians will legislate and manipulate on behalf of big corporate interests, especially when they're controlled by corporations like they are in capitalist America. And we've seen this time and time again, right? Uh, uh, unless the working class consumers start not consuming and affect the bottom line of these corporations, that's when, that's when social responsibility becomes important, right? Then they can send out a nice tweet about how much they care, right? <laughs> Hashtag care, you guys. Hashtag care. Hashtag capitalist lives matter. This is your best right. <laughs> And this brings us to the third basic form of socialism, a worker-based socialism that we saw during the labor movement across the globe in the early 1900s. We have the economic system we have with its good points and its bad points, in large part because we don't allow democracy into the workplace. And these socialists right. say capitalism never did that. Capitalism is a hierarchical way of organizing an enterprise. A few people, the owner, the shareholders who have the big blocks of shares, they run capitalist enterprises. The mass of us have no control at all, and they run it for them. And the way to change society and make it better is to have the people who work in an enterprise, all of them, one person, one vote, have democratic control of the workplace as just as important as having democratic control of the community in which you live, the neighborhood in which you exist, and so on. This kind of socialism is micro-focused. It says, let's not talk only about the government and private enterprise. We don't mind private enterprise. The government doesn't have to control everything. There has to be some coordination. But the big issue for us, say these socialists, is the transformation of the workplace, the socialization of the workplace. So it becomes a community run democratically rather than something run by a small number of people who put their benefits, the so-called bottom line, as profits for them rather than a good life for everybody. Now, democratic socialists believe in democratizing our workplace, right? And in order, to, in order to truly democratize our politics and our society, we have to democratize, democratize our workplace. This form of socialism is about a way of life, a way of life that improves the human condition through social responsibility, co cooperation, and solidarity. One easy way to democratize workplaces is the model of worker co-ops, right? The idea mm -hmm. that the workers own a piece of the company and are part of the decision-making team. And this is far different than owning stock in a corporation, right? Stocks still give the bosses more control, especially when one share of stock is worth like a week's pay. Like, what are you gonna choose? Putting food on the table or buying one stock of a corporation? You know, plus, corporations practice in stock buybacks to make their company look better and retain more control. Look, stocks in Wall Street are pretty much a popularity contest for the, for the rich, and they're not a determination of the economy. And I know I've talked a lot about worker co-ops before, so this is sort of just a little bit of a short refresher, right? This would mean that workers get a say in the future of the company. Right? There's a rotation of upper management that is based on a vote. People vote to put different people in charge of different things. And one of the things a lot of companies have said is that a manager can't be paid more than like eight times that of the lowest employees. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. decreases the income gap, ensures that everyone is treated with dignity and kindness, and it creates a community within the workplace rather than an environment of competition and backstabbing and just really f uninspired water cooler talk, right? You know, just every day you just stand by the, it's just like, no, Randy, I don't give a shit who died in Game of Thrones, all right? You're, stop being a spoiler, you dick. <laughs> 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 Fucking, by the way, Game of Thrones, most contemporary show I could think of for this reference. <laughs> <laughs> So, in the capitalist dystopia of America, though, CEOs and bosses are making upwards of 
300 to 400 times that of an entry level employee, right? Wages have remained stagnant and wealth continues to be funneled upward. At this point, we're looking at wage slavery in America. And if the richest country in the world has a vast amount of poverty, then I'm pretty sure that you're keeping the working class enslaved. And that's primarily what the system runs on is slavery, right? In order to ensure that the mass wealth, the mass wealth of the few, it means that most of us have to suffer. But capitalists love to point out how socialism would lead to poverty and destitution and more slave-like conditions. And when you ask them to show proof of something like that, they just throw a smoke bomb and yell Karl Marx and run into the darkness. <laughs> In fact, Karl Marx, who some consider the father of modern socialism, was 100% anti-slavery. Right? And he didn't say that because that was the on fleek things to say, thing to say, right? Kids are still saying on fleek. That's still a thing. Uh, <laughs> I don't true. know. I haven't been a kid a long time. Yeah, I feel like I feel like Karl Marx would use the word on fleek about things. Right? <laughs> like capitalism, not fleek. <laughs> <You know? laughs> But no, he said that because it was the right and socially responsible thing to say, right? Marx pointed out the need for slavery as, as an important paramount for capitalism. In order to make the value of the products worthwhile and turn a profit, it relies on slavery to make that happen. In capitalist America, slavery was so important that there were, we fought a civil war over it. And even that didn't end the practices of slavery, but it did evolve into a very special kind of bigotry, you know, one that involved like yeah. pretending you're a ghost all the time while calling yourself a dragon for some fucking reason. <laughs> <laughs> a grand dragon. A grand dragon, <laughs> which what does it have to do with ghosts? Nobody knows. That's the secret. <laughs> right? You hoist a flag of the loser all the time. And I think this is the biggest cardinal sin, uh, sin of uh, capitalism is an excessive amount of truck nuts. Too many truck nuts. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, there's too many out there. One is too many. One is, yeah. yeah. Well, I feel like a two would be too many, but that's fine. Uh, <laughs> one would be hilarious if it's just one. A single truck nut. A single <laughs> testicle on a truck would be hilarious to me, but we're deviating. We're, we're, <laughs> But look, capitalism is fine with this kind of bigotry, right? As long as they can exploit that fear and bolster hatred to turn a profit. I mean, really think about it. In order for a successful crane rally, you need a hefty amount of lumber, right? Lighter fluid, a lighter and a good one, not a cheap big one. You're going to go for the classy shit. And at least like two dozen sheets. You can find all of that shit at Bed Bath & Beyond. <laughs> and at the end of it, you probably earn yourself enough points to get like at least a 15% off coupon. <laughs> Not bad for a racist. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> now, Republican President Abraham Lincoln said the following in his first State of the Union address. Labor is prior to and independent of capital. Capital is the only fruit of labor and could not have existed if labor had not first existed. Labor is, the, is superior of capital and deserves the much higher consideration. To translate Abraham Lincoln, fuck your bottom line. Hmm. <laughs> I, think, I think Abe might have said it a little bit more eloquently than that, but you know, that's just <laughs> fuck is like paraphrasing. <laughs> but Lincoln at this point, was reading Marx. In fact, after the Civil War ended, Marx wrote to Lincoln, you know, congratulating him on, uh, on, on the victory on this, uh, and on a second term. And the UK ambassador to Lincoln wrote back to uh, Marx saying that Abe considered Marx a friend. So if the GOP are really going to consider hmm. themselves the I'm party of that. Lincoln, right, they better start taking up some socialist platforms like you know, empowering the working class, decentralizing the banking industry, providing citizens with universal health care, just little tiny socialist moves to be the party of Lincoln.
<laughs> but the Republican Party today is not the party of Lincoln, right? It's the party of private industry and white supremacy. It's the party of racism. They're basically the right wing of the American war economy and shouldn't really take claim to be the party of a pro-labor leader like Lincoln. I mean, realistically, the Republican Party is, is basically the Whig Party now. That's a niche joke for people that know his, that's fine. Um, <laughs> I would say, I don't know who's gonna actually get this joke, but I like it. I think it's funny. I think it's funny. <laughs> the Whigs were before the Republicans, a lot of the Republicans came from the Whigs. That's where Lincoln, Never mind. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> now, at the end of the Civil War, America had an opportunity to divest from private industry and push a new pro-worker political philosophy, right? As social democracy in America would have been perfect for 1872. Now, Marx and Lincoln differed in various different ways, right? Primarily the use of money to value labor. Lincoln was all about paying the working class what they were worth, and Marx saw this as a new form of slavery. And look, based on the way things are going now, it kind of looks like Marx was, was, was right about this, right? This is projected today, not just in how little the American working class is paid, but also in the fact that we partner with countries that rely on slave labor, right? Nike, for example, uses slave labor while trying to uplift a community <laughs> that has a torrid history with slavery. I mean, it's, it's crazy. It's like they almost like didn't really care about slavery and were just kind of saying some shit almost to like sell some fucking shoes. <laughs> but who would be so rude? <laughs> <laughs> no one I know. <laughs> I know, it's crazy. But not just that, but look at what happened to mining towns throughout the 1900s, right? These towns were owned and operated by coal companies who paid their employees in scripts or fake money that could only be used in that town. That was basically a form of slavery, using fake money as a point of control. But it's okay, the coal companies had an answer for that, right? They basically said that they were giving the miners access to money, is what they were, they were giving them. <laughs> it's nice, that's what you, you want access to things. You don't just want right. the things, you know? <laughs> but the issue in a capitalist economy is, is that it's a way of life, right? The bosses control the working class's worth. That's what they do. They don't use money as a tool, but they use it as a point of control and exploitation, right? Capitalism is basically like every shitty X that you've ever had just combined into one economic force, but with a 6.8% interest. So <laughs> pretty cool. <laughs> Now, the capitalist form of labor affects mental health of a lot of workers too, right? Workers don't feel connected to the things they create because the bosses get all of the credit and a majority of the products, uh, or, or rather the profits, right? Think about it. Who really gets the credit for the iPod, the iPhone, or any Apple product? Is it the developers? Is it the machinists? No, it's Steve Jobs a man in a turtleneck that has probably never picked up a hammer in his life. <laughs> Even I've put together a chair in my lifetime, you guys. <laughs> Proud of you. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's a big moment. It's a big moment for me. In the capitalist labor market, the worker is alienated not only from the fruits of their labor and their creation, but also their fellow workers, right? Cubicles. Cubicles create an isolated environment. It's just you, your Excel spreadsheet, and your cat poster. That's it. <laughs> and you know what poster I'm talking about. You know, you know the hey, one where the cat, Friday. yeah, the cat's hanging onto the branches, you know, and it's, and it's mm -hmm. kind of struggling, but, and it says hang in there, but really, mm -hmm. but you know what that cat's really saying, right? You can look at it, you look the cat right in the eyes and you're like, I know what you're saying. You're saying my parents love my brother more. I get it, I get it. <laughs> I know exactly what that's saying. <laughs> now, I will say the one positive of the isolated cubicle culture is that 
you know, you can probably drink to your loneliness and like masturbate in peace. There you go. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> A nice quiet place with your loneliness. A mental health professional, Dr. Harriet Fraud, says capitalism has created an adversarial relationship between employees and employers, as well as employees and other employees. There is a whole alienation of people from one to another. Plus, the way employment works is no one will hire you to do a job if you can't make more for your employer than you're getting as a salary. So you're always being robbed. He's always getting more. He's always trying to get more for him or herself than they give to you, which doesn't breed trust and kindness well, it, amongst it, people. Right. It's an old argument of the critics of capitalism who use often the word alienation, that being, if your job is always a situation where the employer, the boss, is trying to get more out of you and pay you less in one way or another, you're setting up a tremendous adversarial situation in which you, you're on guard, you're, you're distrustful, you're bitter, you, you're unhappy. Look, human beings are social creatures, right? We need each other. Our evolution and the creation of tools occurred through cooperation, not hyper-competitive bootstraps mentality. But this is one of the major arguments that capitalists have made, right? If left to our own devices, we'd choose to run a capitalist society. It's the natural way of handling things like, you know, using exploitation and fear-mongering and commodifying everything and everyone all the time. That's just how nature operates, you guys. So, you know, if you're looking for like a green kind of natural, organic economic system. There you go. It's probably capitalism, you know? You know what the strange part is? Uh, wolves haven't invented capitalism. Right? <laughs> <laughs> They're rather cooperative in their societies. Their behavior is very much uh, capital, uh, uh, cooperative, you know? It's almost like the wolves are like Darwinian socialists. Like a new form of socialism that I just invented. <laughs> Right. Chimps, chimps are very close to human beings. They haven't invented capitalism. Although there is an experiment where, where chimps were uh, introduced to money. They got money uh, and immediately started prostituting themselves for bananas. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of feel like the only part of human life that's like natural to capitalism is using sex to, you know, get bananas. <laughs> <laughs> Which I feel like is a, um, is going to make grocery stores real fucking weird. <laughs> <laughs> but the socialist principles of worker co-ops are more natural to human behavior than the competitive slavery brace grind of capitalism, right? The socialists of the labor movement said eight hours to work, eight hours to sleep, and eight hours to do what we please. The right. labor movement fought for the eight hour workday and less slave-like conditions. But capitalism doesn't believe in that, right? We're at a point where most Americans can't even afford a $400 emergency. That is the cost of four tires on your car, at least for, for my car, it's, that's, that's about what it, what it costs, right? And this is on top of excessive debt that keeps mounting to, to keep things like a car or a house. So in order to stay afloat, most of these workers have to work two or three jobs. So there goes the eight hours to sleep or do what we please. Capitalists want a 24 hour work schedule where they make money hand over fist on a constant basis over the exhausted bodies of the American working class. And we have to take on all these jobs to, to work as much as we do because poverty is looked at as a crime. It's shameful to be poor. And leisure is looked down upon in a capitalist society too, right? It's said that Americans spend about $400 a month on vacations, entertainment, and other frivolous and unnecessary luxury items. Yeah, look, this is why we don't value art 
right? Art speaks out against the status quo, opens your mind and helps you think critically. And it makes us all a little bit more creative. But if it's seen as superfluous, then it's easy to cut and keep an entire populace in dark without questioning things like why housing and healthcare are privatized and unaffordable. And this is why capitalists claim that, especially capitalists in America claim that if we switch to socialism, then my job as a comedian would be over because it's seen as so frivolous, you know? Socialists mm -hmm. have valued at mar and partnered with our uh, artists of all kinds. Artists are and always have been a part of the working class. You know who can take a joke? Eugene Debs, Karl Marx, <laughs> Friedrich Engel. I, I bet fucking all these people would love this show, right? Mother Jones. <laughs> I get a fucking standing ovation from that octogenarian, probably, maybe. <laughs> if she had her cane, if she had her cane, she could fucking do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know who can't take a joke? Anyone that makes over $400,000 a year. <laughs> <laughs> They're like the only people that see art as frivolous are capitalists, right? Because artists don't want to work for them. We want to work for ourselves right. and the betterment of mankind as a whole. Now, occasionally you do get artists that work for the system, right? Your Jeff Foxworthy's or the racist puppet master, Jeff Dunham, you know? <laughs> <laughs> or friend of war profiteers, Alan De DeGeneres. <laughs> so mm. there's, you know, some people that do. Also, how many yachts are necessary for one person to have, right? How many cartons of ice cream is it necessary for one family? How many private <laughs> jets are necessary? Look, the working class are, are, is chastised all the time, all the time for wanting a little bit of a, 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 art and leisure, but the rich never are, right? The rich are living on uh, constant vacations over the hard work of the proletariat. <laughs> This is, this is kind of, you know, people don't really talk about it a whole lot because in capitalism, the, the bosses are fetishized, right? Someone in the working class could eventually become the boss. So more people are willing to give these big shots a, a free pass. Now, one of the other arguments within capitalism is that, well, the bosses are the ones that put the capital forward, you know, to create the factory or the businesses and build these facilities that these workers are working in. So, so they should get more back in return because they took the risks and made the investments. And that's that true. More. Yeah. But when we, the people, participate in the stocks and take risks there and it fails us, we're basically left to eat it. Right. And look, if that is the case, right, they are the ones that put the capital forward, then shouldn't the bosses also be producing some of this labor too, right? Wouldn't that make a little bit more sense? I don't know about you, but I haven't seen Jeff Bezos in one of his football sized warehouses taking only 38 seconds to pee. <laughs> That's the last time we saw that. Like, this is literally like, your parents asking you to pay off the hospital bill just because you were born. <laughs> <laughs> and my argument is that sometimes the kids do pay that off, you know, yeah. with like self-hatred and chronic anxiety. So <laughs> was that too sad? Oh no. <laughs> 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 just sort of like one fading awe in the background. <laughs> That was Jessica. <laughs> oh, no. That's because it's too real. It's too real. <laughs> exactly. This is, this is the part of the, the show where I, I, I reach into your soul and I, I display it for everybody. That's what I'm <laughs> But it's okay because the working class is also going through this chronic anxiety too, you know? Look, you're allowed to take a vacation. You're allowed to have leisure time. That's the idea behind the eight hour work day, right? Most days I work between nine to 13 hours to ensure that I can you know, be kind of poor and not just destitute in the streets, right? And I'm not, most Americans are in the same boat too. And here's the thing, in other nations, that's not the case. In other nations, minimum wage jobs, people that have minimum wage jobs can afford to take a vacation and they get paid sick leave. 
that a McDonald's employee in Norway gets more vacation time than just about any American worker, regardless of field or salary. Meanwhile, in the United States, we abuse our low-paid workers and lambast them for being lazy and not finding a better job. Yeah, not only yep. do Norwegian McDonald's employees get vacation time, uh, they also don't get any diarrhea after they eat McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> fucking, I don't know what they're doing in Norway, but I feel like we should <laughs> learn some shit. But this obsessive quality with work is the American dream, right? To, to, to one day work hard enough so you can be rich, you know, kind of, sort of, I, probably not really. <laughs> Right. If a government and a society isn't going to be there for you at your worst, then why even have a government, right? The pull yourself up by your bootstraps uh, argument advocates for anarchy far more than Antifa or actual <laughs> anarchists like Emma Goldman. Right. With socialism, not only would it mean uh, a more democratized workplace, but also a government and an economic system that would ensure things like housing, food, medicine, and basic human rights. The point of work wouldn't just be to make money, but it would give workers a sense of purpose to be a part of a growing and evolving community. Poverty would not be a shameful, or, or it wouldn't even be a crime, right? But a good reason for the community to come together and lift each other up Right? We would be far more responsible to each other than competing with each other and reveling in the misery of our neighbors. Schadenfreude, you guys have heard of this word, schadenfreude. Uh, it's yeah. a philosophy that humans gain pleasure from the misery of others. Yeah, Th and this is true only for really sad people that don't have a <laughs> sense of purpose or community in their <laughs> lives, right? Mr. McConnell. <clears throat> Mr. McConnell. <laughs> 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 but schadenfreude is how ca capitalist labor markets work, right? You have to compete to outdo and kill your fellow employees for that extra 50 cents an hour. And maybe, maybe a new cubicle with a different mm. cat poster. <laughs> Pretty cool. A socialist labor market is basically the opposite of that. And here's the thing. Socialism has always been a part of the agenda in American politics. In the early 1900s, I mentioned this before, the Socialist Party of America was growing and gaining notoriety. A hundred years ago, 1916 to be precise, was the first time that the Socialist Party of America put forward a candidate for president. His name was Alan Benson, what was his name. And he ran for president 1916, 100 years ago, and he got 600,000 votes in the United States. We were a much smaller country then, and that worked out to 3% of the vote. Okay, the Socialist Party thought that was a good beginning, so they ran again four years later in 1920, a little less than 100 years ago. And they had a different candidate, a man named Eugene Victor Debs, uh, head of the Railway Workers Union, very good orator. And he did better. He got 900,000 votes. That's a 50% increase in four years, 4% of the total vote. Four years later, another socialist ran, 1924. Only he changed the name because by that time, the fear of socialism had led to an enormous effort by the government, most famously the Palmer raids up in Boston, uh, hounding communists and socialists and arresting them and all of that and people got a little scared so what the third effort was they changed the name they didn't call it the socialist party they called it the progressive party and they ran a, a man from wisconsin named robert la follette famous socialist politician from America, wisconsin. wisconsin he ran for president on the progressive yeah. but he was clearly a socialist like the others okay um he got five million votes they went up five times. Wow. It worked out to 17% of the total vote that year for president. Now, I don't want to be that guy and do the whole actually, but actually, Dr. Richard Wolf, who I love, 
uh, did miss one little thing. In 1912, Eugene Victor Debs actually ran against uh, Woodrow Wilson under the Socialist Party of America and garnered uh, a million votes in 1912, which was 6% mm -hmm. at that time. Um, so, uh, and then you had Teddy Roosevelt that was running against, uh, pretty much pushing back against the Republican Party with the Bull Moose Party, and he got 20% of the votes. Uh, so since 19, between 1912 and 1916, there was a drop, but it, and then it picked right back up. But here's the thing, this rise, this popularity in socialism in the early 1900s, the, the, the Democrats couldn't have any of that, right? So again, they used the Espionage Act and the Sedi Sedition Act to prosecute and attack them. But here's the thing, it's back, baby. Socialism is back on the agenda in American politics, especially in 2020. From a recent poll by NBC and the Wall Street Journal, who worked together on these polls, and this poll showed that 25% of voting Americans believe that socialism is an attractive quality in a candidate when they think about who they're going to vote for. Well, that kind of blew my mind. After over half a century of endlessly demonizing anything and everything having to do with socialism, that one quarter of the American voting population feels they would be drawn to a candidate who said of himself or herself, I'm a socialist, tells you something about change in America beyond what a million other surveys might show. Now, right now, some of the most popular um, socialist ideologies in the American zeitgeist are Medicare for all, universal basic income, universal education, and, you know, just like the general idea of taking care of each other. During this pandemic, a capitalist economy running a so-called democracy created the worst depression this side of the century, an eviction epidemic, a troubled education system, and a climate that is on a fucking debt spiral. Americans are out of work, money, and energy. And Congress goes on vacation. Because, you know, fucking the working class that hard is very exhausting. Guys, it's a lot of hip movement. And yeah, some of these people are old. You gotta, they don't have the hips that they used to, you know? They were a 20-year-old capitalist. They'd be nailing it. <laughs> <laughs> But here's, but here's the thing. Thanks to the folks in the Democratic Socialists of America or the DSA and a nationwide mutual aid revolution, these mutual aid organizations, people were able to feed their families, their neighbors, and overall just take care of each other. It's almost, it's almost, dare I say, like we're becoming a real Christian nation. You know? <laughs> because the reality is Americans are sick of being in medical debt student debt, credit card debt, and owing our cousins $20 for buying us some condoms when we were 24 because we were finally <laughs> going to bang our high school crush. <laughs> Bullshit, Randy. That you were doing me real. a favor, you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> that, that one's personal. That one's you know, it's, it's fine. <laughs> but... Look, there's a lot of folks that look at people like myself, Dr. Richard Wolff, or anyone associated with the Democratic Socialists of America that, that say, well, well, why do you call yourself a socialist when there's so much bad press around it? Well, we wear the badge of socialists proudly because it's a legacy of supporting the working class and ensuring equality and dignity for all people. If we only pay attention to what the corporate media propaganda networks say, about the socialist movement and about socialism in general, we're all going to think that kindness is a dictatorship, right? But if we see it for what it really is, we'll see that the logical next step to actually make America great for the first time ever is socialism. <laughs> Solidarity. <laughs> Thank you guys very much. Uh, that is the end of the show. You guys were awesome. And that has been your fork full of noodles for this week. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, make sure you hit that like button. Make sure you, you are, you're sharing this out with your friends, with your enemies, whoever you think would enjoy this show. 
and, and more importantly, make sure that you are subscribed, whether that you're watching this on YouTube, whether you're watching this on Facebook, listening to the audio version of this show, uh, or on rockfin.com, which is the uh, ad-free blockchain cryptocurrency site where the content creators are a part of the company. So uh, there's no censorship, there's no ads, and we're, we're all part of the family. And if you become a subscriber over at Rockfin for $10 a month, you get all of the exclusive premium content, not just for myself, but from all of the creators on Rockfin, people like Graham Elwood, Ron Placone, Kim Iverson, Jimmy Dore, a uh, ton of people that are on Rockfin. So uh, make sure you are subscribed. Uh, and once again, if you want to get tickets to these live virtual events that happen three times a month on Fridays at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. Go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. You can also become a sustaining member to get free tickets and additional bonus unreleased stand-up comedy and storytelling content. Uh, you can um, also make a one-time donation. Check out all of my stand-up comedy albums. Uh, keep up to date on wh when my live shows are coming out uh, and sign up for my email list. Once again, the website is krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A. -H -H -A. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you next week.